Well, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Um, Suzanne Jabro is a sister of St. Joseph of Carondelet. Did I say that right? Okay. She's a, um, a CSJ, and I know there's a number of CSJs here. Uh, if you're a CSJ, would you raise your hand? Yay. When I met Suzanne, she was the director of uh, minis prison ministry for the Diocese of Los Angeles. And she's been doing this work for 35 years. Uh, she is a colleague of Sister Maureen Clark, who also has been doing this, I believe, for 35 years. And as a novice, what introduced me to prison ministry was Maureen's work. And so I owe her uh, my vocation, in a sense. Uh, and I think the CSJs, if you look at them, and you, you know, the, there's no, I think in God's providence, that SJ there, I think there's that link we have with them. So when you see an SJ, you see an SJ, you know, in the best sense of that word. They are, you know, they really have, uh, Suzanne and Maureen in particular, you know, they've been pioneers in this work. Um, if you can imagine 35 years of, of uh, struggling. And I've asked Maureen a long time ago, how do you do it? Uh, and she said, I keep my focus on the women. And, and I think that's, uh, that was the best advice I've had in this ministry is to keep our focus on the men and the women in the prison. And not just the prisoners, but you know, the guards and the, the COs, the, the administrators, all the human beings are caught up in this awful system. Um, we, uh, we have to keep our eyes on them and, and in them see Christ. Suzanne Jabro lives that vision. She's currently the executive director of Restorative Justice Works uh, Inc. And uh, she is has organized an award-winning program out on the uh, West Coast called Get on the Bus. And uh, she's going to tell us all about that. So I won't go into any details, but I, it's uh, been extraordinarily, su extraordinarily successful. And I look forward to working with them uh, uh, when I get to San Quentin, having uh, the families come up and visit the men there. As you know, California is so spread out, and their prisons are in the middle of nowhere. And so often families it's impossible for them to just to get out to the prison on their own means. So this allows an opportunity on Mother's and Father's Day especially for families to be reunited. So I'll let Suzanne explain that to you, so please welcome her. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me in October so I could see those leaves. I'd like you to just um, stand up if you're a a chaplain or a volunteer in a prison right now. So let's, let's give a hand to this group of colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, we have a lot of wisdom in the room. So I want to welcome all of you, especially, and I want to thank you on behalf of prisoners th throughout the world, throughout the country. Um, this is a grace-filled mission, and we are privileged to be a part of it. You know, every person has a room with a view of the world. And for 35 years, my vantage point has been from inside prisons. Prisons mirror society. The prison industry is used as the solution to our social problems at great human and financial costs, while our, while our social service programs and education diminishes. There's been a 500% increase on the number of women in prison in the last decade. 2.5 million children now have a parent in prison. Children in our detention centers and foster care tell stories of trauma, abuse, and unresolved grief. And the result of our tough on crime policy is an unprecedented number of elders in our prisons the old, the sick, and the dying. Behind prison walls walk the wounded, the mentally and physically ill, the illiterate and undereducated, the undocumented, addicted, homeless, poor. The suffering inside the walls is the same suffering as in society. Prisons are the underworld of society and the sign of our failure to heal, to restore lives, and to forgive. And futurists are telling us now that we are experiencing an axial shift, 
that all of our major systems are on the downside of the bell curve. Our education system, our health care system, our institutional churches of every denomination, and the criminal justice system, just to name a few. From my vantage point inside the California prison system, this is how we are dealing with the economic downturn. First, the prisons laid off all of our teachers. Oh, I thought education was a value. Not. Then they cut our programs. What programs? Well, the drug program. You know, 80% of the prisoners are in prison due to addiction. Then they began, the ridiculous thing was to ration toilet paper. That wasn't very lucrative. So they started to furlough their staff, and then they gave them pink slips and laid them off. And then they began to lock the prisoners in their cells on rolling lockdowns 24-7. And now they are looking at the visiting program. I know Oklahoma cut theirs from every weekend to two weekends a month. I heard that last week. And what are we seeing? We're seeing violence escalate throughout the system. Remember, prisons mirror society. Friends, the criminal justice system from my window, in this country, it is imploding. This is a huge challenge and an equally huge opportunity for radical needed change. Today, here at Boston College, the church in the 21st century gathers us for significant collective dialogue on the crisis fueling this raging war in our prisons on prisoners and how we might dream ourselves into a preferred future. When this conference is held, inside a prison and includes prisoners as participants in collective dialogue, we will have crossed over and become a countercultural witness to what it means to be inclusive. This is what our culture and some of our criminal justice administrators are telling us has no value. Exclude them, they say. We are a them and us, they say. No, no. Include them, we say. There is no them and us. There is just us. We are one community. A community embraces its prophetic edge and passion when united and in community. Any 21st century group who wants to focus on transformation knows that proximity matters. Be a community which does not distance itself so far from the poor, the prisoner, that we neither know their situation nor feel responsible. When facing the death penalty in California, we call this comfort zone the killing distance. Proximity matters when choosing to live on the prophetic edge and with passion. Spirituality will be the heart of the 21st century transformation and service will be the hallmark. It is important for you to note, especially those who, of you who are in prison ministry or leaders in this mission, to note what spirituality groups are growing in the current system inside. They are contemplative. They are centering prayer. They are non-denominational spirituality circles. They are contemplative retreats. Religion is what folks argue over. But spirituality is where the common will spring seems to exist. Prayers of the disinherited on the margins have much to teach us. 
My first day in mission in Central Juvenile Hall in Los Angeles, a young child came up to me. It was my first day. He said, hey, lady, he says, are you from the church? I said, yes, I am. He goes, can I ask you a question? I said, well, sure. What's your question? He goes, who is this guy, Jesus Christ, everybody's talking about? <laughs> that was my entrance. Or a woman at the LA County Jail who said to me one day, <clears throat> Chaplain, I need to talk to you. I don't know anything about God. I didn't get in my growing up any of this that the people are talking about. And I need some help and some assistance. The church of the 21st century will need to differentiate between spirituality and religion. Accompanying men, women, and children all these years has been a complete privilege. It has um, really given my life meaning and purpose. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. I've met incredible companions along the way, like um, Sister Maureen Clark. I see um, in sharing with these colleagues, I. I see that there is a missionary spirit within us, and why wouldn't there be? Since prisons are really third world countries, there is no middle class. You either have the keys or you don't. You either have the, peer, the, the power or you, do, you don't. <coughs> Excuse me, it's my call. I, um, I think that's one of the reasons when volunteers come in, it's difficult because unconsciously there is a pull to belong to one of the other groups. I've had the privilege of sharing mission with some of the leaders of the Department of Corrections and wardens who have absolutely been incredible, who, who know that we need an alternative, who use common sense in mission, who readily say yes to partnering with the community, who want to look at new and innovative programs that actually heal lives. And I've also worked with administrators who have been the complete opposite. I've worked in diocese with Archbishop Hunthausen in Washington. I mean, I, I've had fabulous experiences of being supported by church where the chaplains were, you know, in, involved and in and recognized and supported financially and emotionally and spiritually, and I've had the complete opposite, where the prisoners were marginalized and because the chaplains were accompanying them, they were marginalized with them, as if they didn't exist. I've seen parishes who have just have their eyes focused on mission, on the gospel, who are inclusive of prisoners, victims, their families, and recognize them even in their, in their prayers of the faithful at church and other communities that, you know, we're, we're building a church and we can't be doing anything like that right now. Um, so I think we've, we've all had maybe both or recognized both. We want to be more inclusive um, and it is far easier to, to be involved in prison ministry if you have that kind of support where um, we are working as one with a focus on healing. If we ask ourselves, where is the source of hope and light in mission? I would say the strongest source for me is in accompaniment and presence, which some of you do as you go inside. There's nothing really to do. John spoke of it well, you could hear it in his heart that that accompaniment is at the heart of mission. There are many children and adults in prison who have no one. There are no letters, there are no visits, and there is no one in their corner for whatever reason. And this is the poverty in the United States that Mother Teresa readily talked about. When people feel unwanted and unloved, Every year, a group of us around Valentine's Day send Valentine's Day cards to the prisoners that we have accompanied through the year, just as a sign and symbol that they are not forgotten, sort of a holy day. 
And one of my colleagues went into the Washington State Reformatory, into the hospital, and there was a young man there, and on his tray was this Valentine's Day card in April. And so as they talked and visited, and then she said to him, oh, I see you really like that Valentine's card that we sent you last year. And he smiled and he said, yes. That was the only letter that I have ever received during the time that I've been incarcerated here. That young man had cancer, and he died in prison. Last month, during a spirituality group of women, which we call the Women of Wisdom, they call themselves WOW, there are a hundred of them, a hundred of them who gather every month with about 25 women from the community. And in the course of the sharing, a woman about 60 stood up and she said to the group, you know, I don't think you realize this, but I never go to the prison visiting room. You are my monthly visitors. And that night, that whole group realized that we were her monthly family visit. And she is not alone. And as she wept in the reality that on the outside there was no one, but the outside had come in and, and she felt a sense of belonging here. Um, I realized that she was not alone. I received a thank you letter when I was in graduate school from a young man that I had met at Juvenile Hall 10 years earlier. The letter was sent to the Central Juvenile Hall Chaplain's Office and they sent it on to me. And it said in the letter, I just want to thank you for being the person who came to tell me that my father died so that I didn't have to hear it from a guard. And I remember Dennis. There was no return address, it just said Dennis. I remember Dennis. I remember the circumstances that happened around that moment when I had that message to deliver to him. I remember how, what happened in the weeks after. I was very moved that he remembered that and that this letter mysteriously came from nowhere. One of the things about prison ministry is that the power and effect of the kindnesses that are shown to prisoners who feel so void, you will never know, none of us will ever know the impact that that makes on someone's life. And we have to be okay with that. Those pondering release from prison worry about securing a job. Imagine what a pro parolee faces alongside a Boston College graduate of 2011 in the job market. They both stand there saying, where am I going to live and who is going to hire me? And then the prisoner is saying, I've never seen the internet. I've never talked on a cell phone, and I've never had a cup of Starbucks coffee. I've been locked up 25 years. Who will help me? Stand next to that person in your mind. Daunting, isn't it? Gigi works in my office. She served 29 years in prison. And at the staff reflection, after Thanksgiving last year, which was her first Thanksgiving out, she came in and wanted to share with us what a great Thanksgiving she had. And I thought, oh, her first Thanksgiving in freedom. How wonderful this must have been. She says, you know what I did? She goes, I joined a group of people and I went downtown and served the homeless. It was fabulous. I was like, mm. I said, well, <clears throat> that is fabulous. She says, I was late for my family turkey, but it was okay. And I was thinking about that giving. You know, we gave her a job. She's giving to the homeless poor downtown. She comes back and she shares that with us. We're all moved. So I'd say the church of the 21st century, number one's got to show up. They got to cross over. They've got to accompany and companion those in greatest need. 
Many times, if you're a volunteer in prison, people may say, oh, you know, you got to be careful, like your dad said. Um, you know, be careful. I mean, there's a lot of fights. We watch television. We know what goes on in prisons. <laughs> but I have to say, I only, only witnessed one fight. And it was, um, you know, timing is everything. It was at Easter Sunday Mass, and Bishop Zavala was celebrating the liturgy, of course, at Central Juvenile Hall. And I had gone to communion. I was sitting over to the side, and all the kids were kind of coming up the aisle. And um, of course, I had my eyes closed. You know, the music is playing. All of a sudden, you hear this bam, 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 bam. This kid came down the aisle, and I guess he looked at a kid in the front pew and let him have it. And the, the, when I opened my eyes, the staff was pulling this kid out through the sacristy. It was quite dramatic. But the child had this rage on his face. I mean, a frightening rage on his face. And he dragged him out. And after mass, I went outside. And I could see them, two of the staff, taking him across the yard to what we call the hole, the ad sec. And um, I decided I was going to go over there and talk to him. I was really worried about his rage. And um, so I went over, and the, off, the staff said, you better come out here, the church lady's here, and you better come out here and apologize for you know, going off in the church. And So here comes this kid and hanging his head, and he comes and he sits across from me and he goes, I'm sorry, chaplain, for disrespecting the church. And I said, you know, I'm not here because you disrespected the church. I'm here because when I looked up, I saw this rage on your face. And he said, well, I thought that was my rival gang, and I didn't expect to get in a fight. I didn't see him till I got up to the front. And from words from I don't know where came to me, I said, who did this gang kill that you love so much? And he stared at me for the longest time, and then he said, my brother. He died in my arms. He was 14 years old. I put my hands in his across the table and said, I am so sorry. Anger, fear, and violence are rooted in the soil of pain. Unresolved grief and its pain are fertile soil for violence. And many persons in our prisons have not healed from their own victimization. Many of our people have not had the opportunity to even understand where the rage is actually coming from. The grace of compassion, friends, is the gift to be given. In prison, we find our brothers and sisters in the ditch, severely wounded, and we pull them out and bind their wounds and offer them shelter. We reach out and touch them, expressing sorrow for their loss. We lift them up in mindfulness. We are about restoring people to their lives and restoring the community in which we live. The grace of compassion lives within each of us. What does the church of the 21st century have to do with violence and victims? South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission placed victims at the center. They were serious about healing their community. Victims came first. Victims must come first. They need to be at the center of concern. Healing and restoring lives necessitates different questions that are being asked in the retributive model of justice which exists today, not who did it and how much punishment should they get, but rather, who is hurt? What do they need? Is this the missionary activity of the 21st century, the embodiment of the power of healing and healing justice in a world standing in need? Well, since I'm at a college, I thought that I would share with you some college experiences I'm having in California that are involved in prison ministry. And I think this is gold. And I'm going to share it with you in hope that you, too, may find ways to cross over. 
we have a formal crossover experience in California. And the big ones, which I'm going to talk to you about, bring about 125 people from the community into the prison and meet with about 250 women. Now, it can, or men, it can be lifers, it can be the young 18 to 25 year old folks coming into prison early on. It could be um, the golden girls, those over 60, whatever. We spend the day together. The outsiders pay $30 so that we, they provide lunch for themselves and two women. And we have conversation and we share a meal together. And I had a University of California Irvine student come in and they were going back and forth. The outsiders were saying why they came and the insiders were saying, telling them the one thing they thought was the most important and then they'd all come to the microphones and hear, share what they heard. This University of California Ir Irvine student comes forward and she's, she was from the social ecology department, criminal justice. So she, she comes up, she says, I'm going back to the university. I'm taking my criminal justice book. I'm throwing it in the trash. This is so not how it is. <laughs> <coughs> Though oh, there was a great applause by everyone in the room. They got it. You know, this is so not how it is. That college started a woman in criminal justice network. And they have a club on campus that deals with women's issues. I don't know about you, but my, our college students in California are extremely organic. So the Claremont College students came for a crossover with the younger members of the community. And of course, the the women inside wanted to know what was going on on the outside and what these women were wearing that are in college and it all became very important. But when the, when the college students heard what they were eating, oh, they were just so upset. So they have started an organic garden and it is gigantic in the women's prison. It is the first time they've had fresh vegetables and fruit for years. They garden with the lifers on Fridays and Sunday mornings. There is one at Rikers Island as well there's a book out calling Doing Time in the Garden. So I can see this younger generation, when they cross over, they use their own gifts for what, how they see they can give back. I am totally impressed with the generosity of our youth. They are passionate about the common good. And they are passionate about helping the world community. And I, I, I'm learning from them. I'm very impressed and very heartened by that. I can't leave without adding in, in the crossover story, a crossover story about one of our favorite Jesuits, Mike Kennedy. Well, I invited him the other night to come to the WOW group. And um, he brought his cohorts. Now, I don't know, those of you who've been in prison for a long time know you always, you know, it, it is a border crossing at the prison. And you never know whether you're really on that list or you're not on that list. Doesn't matter if you've been there five years. I mean, they don't. They look at you like, well, who are you? You know. So, <clears throat> and then the room you've been using for three years is now taken by someone else, and no one knows how that happened. Well, anyway, it's just like it's. It may, let me just tell you this. This may help. In a normal environment, normal behavior is normal. In an abnormal environment. Abnormal behavior is normal. Now for us coming in, in an abnormal environment, normal behavior is abnormal. <laughs> so if you get that down, you're gonna feel a lot better about how you're interacting here. But, okay, so it's the, so we call every day. Right, is everybody on the list? Is everybody cleared? Is everybody cleared? Is everybody cleared? Email comes, everyone is cleared. Oh, fabulous. We arrive at the prison, we have 20 regular volunteers on these seven guests. So they announced to the seven guests, you know, you're not on the list. I probably have a nervous breakdown. What do you mean they're not on the list? I have an email here, which means nothing. You know, who wrote that email? So um, <laughs> out comes our sponsor. The sponsor calls the guy at home as the community project person. They're all cleared, he said. We said, what, they're not in the computer. You know, that happens. We're so sorry. Oh, you left home at two o'clock and drove, took you two hours to get here? Doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay, so we go outside. Everybody else goes in. The Jesuit, only the Jesuit says, you know, I don't know. I know the producer of the movie Hangover, and he's a friend of the governor, Schwarzenegger. 
do you think I should call him? I said, go to your car and get your cell phone. Call everyone you know. So he goes to the phone, goes to the phone, he calls up the producer from wherever, and he is on it like 911, okay? Yes, Father Mike, stay where you are, as if we were going anywhere. Stay where you are, and he said, I'll call you back. So we wait, we wait, pretty soon the phone rings. Now, this is 6.30 at night, you know, everybody, all the offices are closed. The head of the volunteer services for the Department of Corrections calls from Sacramento. Oh, Father Mike, we are so sorry. We just love our volunteers. We hate to see them treated this way. I'm like rolling my eyes like, we get treated this way every month, I don't know. Okay, so anyway, all of a sudden it's a big deal. All right, now, <clears throat> if you stay right there, we're calling the warden at home. I go, oh my God. So, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm the person that has to go back there every week. So I go in, I say to the lady at the desk, the officer, you know, I think the shift lieutenant's gonna be coming out here because somebody at the governor's office called the, is calling the warden at home. She says, you should have told us, Sister Suzanne, that this, this, this was a very important group. I go, listen, every single one of my volunteers is a very important person. You know, there's no differential here, but you know, for her. So anyway, out comes the shift lieutenant. Where are these people? Get them in. So we are running through the scanner, and we, we have all this violins and all no equipment list. Everybody just goes in. We run across the yard. Now, there are... It's a room like this. A hundred women and our 25 volunteers have already been told we got sent home. The doors fly open. In we come. There's this huge roar of, oh my God, the prison break. And so here we are. <clears throat> what happened? What happened? I said, well, the Jesuit knew the governor, and the governor called the warden, and the warden called the ship lieutenant. Here we are. You know, oh, my God. Mike comes up to the microphone. He goes, you know, you can't always let the system win. And everybody. <laughs> Oh, everybody, the violin comes out. And we only have 20 minutes left here. Violin comes out, starts playing. Mike tells the story of Mary and Martha. All of a sudden, lavender oriole is passed around. We are all anointed. We gather in a closing circle in silence to, to gather our strength. There is not a, cr a dry eye in the house. I will always remember that night because I said, tonight... There was a prison break at the women's prison. Tonight, God visited her people. There was so much freedom or joy or unexpected in that moment. And I, was, I really felt that the power of the grace of God was present there for all of us. We will always remember that night. The church of the 21st century, this is the question I have for all of us, questions. Can we find ways to cross over, to bring our people with us, to dissolve the social distance that breeds non-responsibility? Can we use ongoing reflection and ex well, experience, reflection and action listen to and learn from those on the margins. Those farthest from the seats of power will challenge presuppositions and stereotypes. Engaging issues with prisoners will revitalize communion. This, <clears throat> this is the best place to be situated to discern mission. It is all about nearness, one of the fundamental themes of scripture. Communion with the poor and the prisoner holds transformative power. Accompanying prisoners changes lives, worldviews expand, and conversion is abundant in hearing and believing in the sacred they know. Friends, passion follows, it does not lead. We need to breathe new life into neighboring by crossing over and then asking how propelling ourselves to the edges of society affect my soul. What did I learn from the new neighbor? 11 years ago, a group of, of course, nuns 
decided that they needed to go to our women's prison located in the middle of the state of California where there are 8,000 women incarcerated in the largest women's complex in the world. Two prisons next door to each other. This is where our women's death row is. We decided we needed to go. <clears throat> Some of them are provincials in different communities and ask the women, what is it that we can do for you? Now, you gotta know nuns. If you don't know nuns, I gotta tell you about nuns. <clears throat> We're in the car, it's a four and a half hour drive. So we have a little pad of paper. By the time we get there, you know, we have a binder of all the things that we could do for them because we had already figured it out, okay? <laughs> well, <clears throat> we go in and we, the chaplain had gathered about this many people there and we told them our, what our concerns were and we came because we wanted to listen. So the first woman starts and she says, we never see our children. We never see our children, you've got to help us. We can't live without seeing our children. And she starts to cry. The next woman, equally, I can't live without seeing my children and I haven't seen my child in three years. You've got to help us. The next woman, we are desperate. Help us, help us. 60 women all around the room. No one asked for anything else. They might have asked for one retired nun to write letters. I think somebody put that in her mind, but basically, what they wanted was they wanted to see their kids. So we went next door. Same thing. You know, we had to take our notes. We had to tear them up on the way home in the car. And so we got back to LA. There were only about eight of us that had been meeting monthly. And um, so some of them hadn't gone. So we said to them, this is, we went to the women's prison. This is what they want. To a person, they told us not to do it. No, 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 no. We can't do that. We can't get involved in transportation. It's just you know, legal liability, all that kind of stuff. So I said, well, you know, I think Cardinal Mahoney would like to write this off. I mean, he will cover the insurance. That, so they said, okay, great. I said, I never did ask him, but I was sure he would want to do that. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, we got the, we got a, decided we'd get a bus. So we call up the, um, the prison. This one lady we knew that very, she was very nice. And so we told her what we wanted to do. She says, okay. We're gonna choose some of the, have the women sign up. They chose nine families. There were 17 children, and they hadn't seen their mothers between four and nine years. And they were all over. So of course, you're calling your friends and say, you know, in this town that's an hour and a half away and say, could you go to this home, see this family, see if they wanna get on the bus. Then we called this family, then we called, called this friend of ours. I hardly have any friends left anymore. And they see me coming, <laughs> but anyway, we wrote all the nuns, said fork over the money, we gotta buy, you know, we have to rent this bus. So they did, all the orders sent something. And um, we went to the women's prison. And the first, you know, at first it was all about the mothers. But after the trip, it was all about the kids. And I wanna show you a little clip of Get on the Bus. So my man Flicka, where's my IT man, is right here. Thank God. Thank God. I don't know, do not know how to I do IT. Okay. Get on the bus. This starts in quiet. That's a nice song. But that's nice. I think we'll go with the English. <laughs> it's the first one. Um, this bus, these buses start in San Diego. These children are on the bus for seven hours one way for their four hour visit on Mother's Day.
much that we must say. The time is short, the way is hard. But it all is so worthwhile. A mother's love is what they need in the life of this child. Then he sees her smile, and he hears her voice, and for a while his world is right again. first bus had nine families and 17 children, and last year we had 60 buses with 1,200 children going to seven prisons, and this year we will be going to San Quentin and Old Folsom, which are the mother ships in the Department of Corrections. In the, um, we're waiting to show you the inn, because on the bus on the way home, the children receive a teddy bear from their mother and a letter. We get the teddy bears, of course, and they get this special surprise. Remember one mother evidently knew a little bit about it, so she, little girl came up to me in the middle of the event, and she said, oh, I guess what? There's gonna be a surprise on the bus on the way home. I thought, I'm gonna kill that little mother. And, she, <laughs> she said, and I know what it is. I go, you do? She goes, yes, my mom's gonna surprise me and be on the bus. Oh, oh it was awful, <laughs> it was awful. But um, uh, this has, taken off like nothing I have ever seen in my life in, mis in mission. People throw money at you. I think we're one of the only nonprofits that ever came out in the black all the way around <laughs> in California. We were up at San Quentin because now we go to Father's Day as well. Now I grew up in a, um, with four brothers. I was the only girl. And um, in a, I grew up with Ozzie and Harriet actually. I mean. That, and um, anyway, I told my brothers it was really wonderful growing up with them because it really helped me to feel right at home working in a maximum security prison for men. <laughs> but you would have thought I would have understood how important the child and their father's relationship is because I shared such a fabulous relationship with my father. But the, what's happening at the Father's Day events are very different than what happens at the Mother's Day events. But I, I, I'm just so sold on what mothers do with their children and what fathers do with their children are completely different, and both are seriously needed. And where the mothers are all doing the hair, and, you know, always, and the kids are always in their mother's hair. The fathers, are, the kids are flowing through the air. I mean, they're up and the, down, and they're all over the place. And... Um, the dads, you know, when people go to prison, there's always a long journey before a person finally gets to prison. So you realize that some of those primary relationships got burned out along the way. And families, a lot of them stopped coming. And maybe through guilt, the person who's in prison doesn't want to intrude on adding more burden onto that family. So what we're realizing is as the dads sign their children up, and we accompany some of the children if the caregiver cannot come um, or doesn't choose to come if they're teenagers. And um, we also, um, well, we also provide counselors on the bus in the event the children need that as well. But um, one of the things that I realize is that um, from the dads that we met with after the event, um, and we did realize that a lot of children were coming to meet their dad for the first time with a photo. Coming to meet him for the first time, and the 
ex-wife was usually saying, well, it, now that the child's older, if they want to come, I don't want to come, but if you accompany this child. And they come out saying it was the best day of their lives. You know, little kids, this one little kid, the grandmother was having him have a calendar and check off the days. And he, he said all he wanted was a hug from his dad. He, had, he was, I think, two the last time he'd seen him. He was now 10. And he gave his dad the biggest hug, and then he got on the bus. He told one of the volunteers, oh, this is the best day of my life. I got to talk man talk with my dad. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, a, it's incredible. I, el all the elementary schools, high schools, college kids help. Convol monies come from convalescent homes or from tricycle funds from kindergartens. I mean, it's every, it's, it's something that has captured the enthusiasm of the interfaith community and it is extremely interfaith. So I wanted to share that with you because if we had not crossed over and asked the prisoners what they need, we would have never known that. And so they are the ones that set this on track and this is what has happened. So I'm suggesting that we, the Church of the 21st Century, cross over. And in conclusion, I just wanna say that no one view is universal that collective vision is needed. We all readily acknowledge individual efforts and the call is for collective witness. And I, I wonder as a sister of St. Joseph, in a community that was founded by lay women at a time when they did not want to be cloistered nuns but wanted to be on the streets, mostly with women and children and who stood in need. And now we are coming to uh, celebrations of our 500 year anniversaries. And we too are on the downside of the bell curve, which causes me to say, is the church of the 21st century being led to discern if you, Boston College, if you, Boston parishes, if you are the community called to refound, to birth what it means to live a life that is religious in a new way, in response to the cries of the poor and prisoners of the 21st century, you have the people, you have the network, you have the freedom, you are grounded in the spirituality, you have the gospel, who rather than you, what better time than now, and what better reason than the great love of God? Thank you. We just heard from a woman of wisdom. And I think wow. to really honor, to, to, to honor that moment, I'd just like to take, have us all take a minute of quiet, kind of let some of what we just experienced sink in. Thank you, Suzanne. I feel like get on the bus, I feel like I've been run over by the bus. <laughs> that was so, so powerful, yeah, I hope they're. Um, uh, just uh, a few logistical things. We're going to take uh, some time now and uh, I'd like to invite Suzanne and John and Tom to come up to the table here and have some communication, some dialogue. Um, Suzanne mentioned about how you know, we, we try to have a collective dialogue and we can't have a conversation with all 200 of us at once, but Here's a chance to kind of ask some questions if, uh, if you'd like or um, whatever, we have the time to do it. I think we have about 20 minutes for that and just also logistically after that so you know what's coming. Um, after the questions, uh, the session with uh, our panel here, we're going to take a five minute break. Now, I would invite you to use the restrooms, get some coffee during this time anyway. I'd like, when we take the break as much as possible, stay where you are, because we're going to be setting up for a brief prayer service. Um, and then following the prayer service, we'll have a lunch, box lunch will be outside. Also, I believe outside there are various displays, books, uh, literature available, various prison ministries. So 
at some point during the day, if you haven't already, go out and, and check out what's there. So that's basically it. Our, our, um, our panel, brief break, prayer service, and then lunch. So uh, why don't I have uh, panel people come up here? And we'll have people bringing the mics around to you. So if you'd like, if you have a question or comment, just raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. Is um, Adam of us still in the running for one of the five best we get? Sister, you did a wonderful job of, uh, especially when you say they know what they need, just listen. And when you said it should be taking place inside and in at Norfolk, before everything was the turned uh, down, uh, there were prisoners, lifers, who had managed to organize in order to have a meeting like this one taking place inside the prison. But this is all gone since then. One thing I want just to add, because it, it's something which is in the mind of our uh, 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 fellow citizens, the, the, the use of the term nonviolent prisoner has done a terrible job, I think, because when you speak of nonviolent prisoners, are people who might be rescued from their crime, you see. It suggests that the violent prisoners are there and they should be there because they are lost souls completely. And I want to testify as a sociology teacher you know, at Norfolk for 20 years, that when you get to know those criminals, those murderers and all that, it's amazing how they are more or less on their way to trying to reconstruct themselves really entirely. And these are the, 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 the people who are ready to welcome us if we are ready to treat them as fellow human beings. I'm sorry, but I needed to say that because it is something which is so prevalent in the press, you know, in the politics, everything. You know, the violent prisoner, we don't even speak about them. They are, they are forgotten and let them die there. I think it's another, um, I think it's a very good point to bring up, and I believe it is another uh, expression of a them and us. There's always got to be that under, we're always putting each other in these categories. Yeah. And they, they don't exist, we need to wipe them out. My experience has been with women um, in the Dartmouth House of Correction in Bristol County. And I have found that the majority of the women in that facility, if you look back in their lives, it is a piece of unresolved grief that started yeah. them. Right. It, something happened that they couldn't deal with, right. and so they got numb. Right. And then they stayed numb through alcohol and drugs, which led them to crime, which led them to jail. And, and it's really that, that pivotal piece of unresolved grief and there doesn't seem to be a lot available that deals with that for them. Right. And yet that's what they need the most. If they, could, if they could find a way to heal that piece of them that was so broken so long ago, right. and if they could see the connection to where they are now, I think mm -hmm. their lives would be so different. Right, exactly. I just had a reflection on that. I was thinking about the term that um, Robin Kazerjian has sort of put into our imagination, houses of healing. And the point that um, you were making, Suzanne, about contemplative prayer or spirituality groups, it may very well be that we, we, we certainly can't bring enough therapists into the prisons, but groups that are organized uh, as sort of contemplative uh, reflective groups may create a space where people might be able to access that, that painful and cut off and split off part of their lives. And I think I, we've certainly seen this in some of the groups uh, that have gone on at Norfolk. But I, I think part of the, what's profoundly healing about that is that it provides an opportunity to create a safe space where uh, that can be known and shared.
one of the things I feel as a volunteer in the prisons is part of the system that's broken. I feel like I'm part of that. And the frustration for me is that I feel a need to work outside the prison somehow in the rest of the community to change our public perception that creates this system and sustains it. I'd like any suggestions you might have. My, my, <clears throat> my view is, and I, for all of you who work in prison, you go home and you're trying to tell people what, hap what just happened to you tonight, even if you went one time. <clears throat> it's, it's so difficult to share how, to share the reality that prison ministry is so not what people think prison ministry is all about. Okay, so then you, you go inside, you have this, these profound experiences, and you come out, and I, I think that it's transformational for us. The little things, I'm not just saying there was any big old magic moment, but I do think that the power is in the experience. So I am committed to bringing as many people inside as I possibly can. So I've had a warden that was so open to that. And the warden that George, or George is going, San Quentin, oh my gosh, I have never seen a prison that is, because they're in the city, so Berkeley's there, so, you know, Stanford's there. They're used to volunteers coming in. They just welcome it. And um, whereas telling people about it, it it's, it's hard because the stereotypes that are on television and to totally coming at them are so strong until they, you know, they've never met a prisoner. So how do they know? So I, I just find that the best way is to, you know, cross them over. You just hope that you have wardens who open doors. I mean, it was very common that they're in the society because we mirror each other. <clears throat> we were far more open to the community participating than we are now. So that's a struggle for us, all of us. But I see, I know what you mean. <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see, Sister, if through your program, if the kids that participate decide that they're going to do something, you know, in their life. Because when yeah. we were growing up, you know, we, we only knew of Scared Straight, where yeah. you took us into yeah. the prisons and it right. was like, look how bad this is, be good. Right. You know, but instead of teaching kids that you don't have to be scared, these people need help too. That's right. You know? That's right. There's a... Sister Suzanne, my name's Kathy, Karen Kathy, from, uh, known by my, my prisoner <laughs> friends at uh, Bridgewater and also in Concord. And I, I had a question that I just wanted to talk for a minute about what we're doing here because we're looking for volunteers. Um, do you have alternatives to violence in project? Yes, it, do you? it is. It's one of the best programs in the state. That's system. wonderful. That's great because I know we're in at least 38 states and also emotional awareness and healing, which I believe was referred to before which is another one that we do with the men, and it, it really helps them to get out that frustration and that anger through a process over mm. 10 or 12 weeks. And um, I wanted to just say that we, it, what, the work that we do is spiritual, but the wonderful thing is that it's non-denominational so that we attract every nationality and every, every ethnic group and every, every background into, into, and yet it is spiritual because it's grounded in the values of Christian faith, you know, Judaism, Islam, that, you know, do unto others, respect, we create ground rules, and we create a community of, of love, connection, understanding, and support. And if anybody's interested, if it's okay if I, if I do this, um, if you want to see me at the break, we are, we are in, uh, I think we're in probably six out of the 16, I think there's 16 um, state prisons. We have lots of county prisons, too. We're also looking to get these programs into the communities. But... Um, if you are interested at all in going in, I consider it a ministry. It's my ministry, and people that I do this work with consider it a ministry. I'd be more than happy to, to give you my email address and to share more about what we do, because we are trying to get people into the programs, and we want to go into all the prisons. So thank you very much, and thank you for being here today. Yeah, hi. I have a, first of all, um, I'm an ex-prisoner, and um, I served 30 years in prison. And uh, I have an organization that's called the uh, Committee of Friends and Relatives of Prisoners. 
And one of the things we do, we provide free transportation for families back and forth. Uh, we have information and referral benefit. We, we try to help people reintegrate. My question and my comment is in two parts. And I'm going to share a story that goes to the first part of my question is dealing with the role of prison ministry and the role of the faith communities in relation to the policies that destroy rehabilitation, that feed recidivism. We had um, a woman who was a member of our committee who was blind. Her husband was a mathematician um, who had a drug problem. He served five years in prison. When he got out, because of state law, he could not live with his wife because she received uh, government assistance and she was in government assisted housing. So this woman who was blind, she was forced to choose between her government benefits and being with her husband. This is current state law <coughs> in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what is the role of prison ministry, the faith communities to address those types of draconian policies? Through our program, we were able to get him housing, but unfortunately, he, he started his own business uh, uh, dealing with uh, software for uh, backing up computer systems. He died after he was out for six weeks because of lack of medical care in the prison system. I got a call from the landlord telling me, you're not gonna believe this, Chris is dead. So that's, that's one issue. The other issue is, was touched on briefly, um, is the issue of profit as motivation. I don't know if people know, there's $11 million a year that's generated in this state. Prisoners manufacture <clears throat> garments for every major garment manufacturer. They get 50 cents to a dollar an hour. $124 million a year in license plates. Can't get a job when you get out. So profit is also driving this. So my other question is, what is the role of prison ministry and what is the role of the faith communities to stop that type of exploitation? I, I wanted to, to connect that comment with Ted's over here about feeling there's something that needs to be done of an advocacy nature, right? I think if we have a very broad picture of what we mean by prison ministry, some of us in, in the room will go behind walls. Some of us have that gift. Others of us will be that, that political and spiritual and social pit crew that will uh, do the kind of work to address the, the Cory reform, the fact that if you have a felony record, you cannot get government housing, all these kinds of ways in which we take people uh, into a system, exploit them economically, and send them out so unable uh, to, to compete against, in a tight economy, the, the BC grad or whatever. So if we have a really big picture of this, people can find their way onto the front lines of this reform in a way that really matches their talents and their skills and their passions. But I think the political piece really is crucial, and I'm really glad that you both put that up on the table. I hope that conversation can roll forward today. In our agency, we are committed to uh, accompaniment, which I talked about today, awareness and advocacy. Because if you don't do public policy work and, let it, and have that legislative piece in your work, then you are committing yourself to a permanent underclass of, of particularly women and children, for sure. So we have to do it, and we're very, um, we lobbied really a lot this year uh, on bills that affected the, in criminal justice, we have a whole sheet of the bills that we were supporting, and did a lot of um, lobbying, especially for one bill that was to, um, to, to review the cases of children under the age of 16 who were given life without the possibility of parole when no one in the, the case died. 
asking the courts if they would review them after 10 years and if possible to to commute those sentences to 25 to life and do you know that that bill did not pass it did not pass and one of my our friend Jesuit Mike Kennedy he goes well we might as well just get a gun and shoot the kids and the lobbyist who works for the bishop said, funny you should say that. That's what one of the lobbyists said. Gee, well, you know, we're not killing them. That was his response. So um, it's a lot of hard work. The attitudes that you're talking about are very steeped, um, entrenched. And, um, you know, that we have a lot to, to do relative to advocacy work. And I'm glad you raised it up. Thank you. I think uh, Sister Kathleen in the back there has a question. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm playing favorites here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Paul, get that lady a mic. <laughs> Hold on. Thank you. I I'm not really sure about uh, what I want to say in terms of question, advice. I don't know if it's even appropriate, but I noticed when you spoke, Sister, about the, the women and so forth, Never in any of the conversations has the issue of sex offenders come up. And I wonder how you have dealt with that. It's such a major problem for us. Uh, so many of the men that are being released um, are sex offenders and can find nothing, no place to live, no jobs. And it, it just, it's almost like a, a sentence to return because the only place you can get three squares and a bed that's warm is prison right. for some of these men. So I wonder if there's any, any thought about. It's a, it's a huge issue. It's a huge, huge issue. issue. I'm glad you raised that. I, I was the Catholic chaplain at a um, prison in Washington State of all sex offenders, 5,000 men. And what I, I learned myself in the process, and I think we as a as a whole society, I've learned a great deal more about, um, you know, this whole illness of the sexual predator, you may say. But so many of them talked about a history in their families. It was, you know, generational. And what the treatment was just was to try to help the, the men break the cycle. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of investment in um, therapy there. And it was always funny because, not funny, but they would come to, when they were in the therapy in, in the deep of it, they were not allowed to come to the, to the chapel. Because people hide in religion. They hide there. You know, they feel ashamed and they're going to come to the chapel and, you know, it's all going to be fixed. It's all going to be better. Instead of dealing with the hard issues that they have to deal with that they don't want to deal with. So they'd come running in and say to me, you know, Sister Suzanne, they won't let me come to the chapel. I go back to therapy. When you're finished with the therapy, come back to the chapel. You know, so it was, that was difficult. There's a sister in um, LA who's doing reentry. Oh, she went through terrible turmoil with the diocese over the, where to find housing for these men. And then they, the liability issues, and oh my goodness. So it, it, it is a huge issue because, I mean, they're practically living under freeways. And then if they're in, a, in a, some kind of a hotel, one of these motel things that they have for, you know, housing, and the neighbors find out, they just go berserk. So um, it's very difficult. I don't know what the answer of this is. I don't. Good morning. My name is Lee Farrow, and um, my experience with prison ministry is through uh, a project called Do Right Ministries. It's relatively new, um, but it has been in existence for the past five years. Uh, we work with uh, about 10, currently 10, long-term life sentence incarcerated men in the state of Pennsylvania. And, and so my question, and it's really very much an ecumenical uh, project that really deals with uh, trying to capture lessons and learning to create a community, a virtual community rebuilding project for lessons and knowledge that these men have gained through their experience and their reflections 
through art, through mixed media uh, 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 campaigns, uh, can then get back into communities to really help sort of bolster young people in a way that they make good decisions. Um, it's, it's, it's grounded in uh, prince, spiritual principles, uh, which focuses on um, forgiveness, um, redemption, um, healing, and reclamation. And I'd just like to ask the panel if that is the right order from your perspective that this process should really focus on forgiveness, um, redemption, healing, and then reclamation. And reclamation being the piece that really uh, inspires the inmates and victims to uh, use their spiritual talents to give back the knowledge and wisdom. So that's why we've placed reclamation at the end. So that's, that's the nature of my question. Answer it. Well, uh, the way I'd answer this is <laughs> saying I don't know, um, <laughs> but I would, <clears throat> I did write my master's thesis on the correlation between unresolved grief and incarceration, because I met so many children in juvenile hall that had the death of a significant someone in their childhood, and, I mean, to a person, and then the train wreck of grief losses after that that caused them to act out. and most of them had attempted to kill someone or killed someone. Um, I found that in that process, what, what triggered it, what, what, as soon as what you were saying about the nonverbal, the music or the writing or the art or whatever, that that was a very huge component um, where you can't get to the words always of the, of the depth of what's happening within you, but you can express it in other mediums and that were very important. And relationships with other people were important because people don't trust in relationships after they've had a tremendous loss. And emotionally, how you deal with that anger and, and um, the anger and the, um, well, the pain of it, or the hurt, how you, how you externalize those. And then spirituality, because, you know, where's God in all this? So. I didn't find that they went in a row. I felt that it was like Kubler-Ross's stages. I felt like it, it, it sort of just, you just kept reviewing, going back at deeper levels. You always think you're starting over like you never went anywhere. But, you, but in actuality, you do. And it, sometimes they just switch out. So I guess I'd see it more as a circle. And you know, you're going in at wherever you're going in. It sounds fabulous what you're doing. Just fabulous, so thank you. I just want to say, Tom, did you want to say something? Yeah, please. Maybe a quick comment, because it's, in some ways I hear it as almost a pedagogical question um, in the sense of how do you mentor people through those, through those moments. And I would just simply echo what Suzanne said, that I, I don't see them necessarily as sequential, that you've got to get to forgiveness before you can move on to redemption, mm -hmm. and then you've got to get redeemed before you can go to healing. It, it'll happen in different sequences for different times, different people, different places. And having been through forgiveness once, you'll have to go back to it many, many times because the anger will reoccur and the resentments and all the rest of it. So that I, I see it again as cyclical and as maybe a, a, a collage or, or a, a, um, a, something that weaves together as a whole rather than sequential steps along the way. I was just thinking about the work that uh, Melissa Kelly of your faculty has just done on grief. Um, that does challenge the Kubler-Ross. Well, you got some stages to go through and really sees it, she uses the image of a mosaic for that. Uh, but I did want to say one important thing, as I understood what you mean by reclamation, is recognizing I have a gift to give. And, and I've noticed uh, over the years at Norfolk, one of the things that's most painful is um, men really do want to give back. And that is the secret that the Howie cars of the world want us not to know. Uh, that the men at Norfolk, for example, participate in the annual uh, Walk for Hunger. 141 times around the, the, uh, is the equivalent of their 20 mile walk. Uh, they adopt children uh, abroad. They, in every way, they, they want to say, look, we have something to offer. And um, that's, the, that's the secret that a society that wants to demonize folks and decide they're bad doesn't want to know about is the incredible generosity uh, of men still behind bars and women.
Good morning, I'm Wilhelmina Hill. I'm a Master of Divinity candidate at Andover Newton Theological School. And I too conduct alternative to violence workshops in Norfolk. And a theme that we hear every session we conduct, prison has saved my life. The charge then becomes a charge of discipleship to volunteers, to men and women of faith throughout the world. What can we do to assist these men, these women, these incarcerated people to rebuild their lives when they know that prison has saved their lives? One of them told me, prison has taken me out of the play on the streets yeah. to rebuild my life, to become a father and a husband and a member of a community that I could never become. The charge then to me is what can we do to assist this charge, this call to recovery? Ooh. Thank you. Yeah. I think we need to do more of what you do. You know, more people sharing their gifts. Because I, I've heard that many, many times from prisoners, that uh, prison saved my life. And I, I, you know, and, and what, I, all you could think of is, my God, what was going on in your life? You know, this is good news. So, um, but it is. It is. It's a safer, a safe, I don't know how to say it. It's hard to say it's a safe environment because it's hardly as a safe. It depends on what prison you're in, let's, let's face that. But um, I just think we need, we need a, a, a greater consciousness, a greater community movement and you know, I know the planners of this were shocked, this event, were shocked at the number of people who signed up and the number, then they had to close it. So there's, a, this, the, the spirit and the grace is here. You, the, you know, it's the get on the bus thing. It, you know, if you see it, you got to move because you've got the momentum. Something, you are, some chord is being struck here. And I don't know what it is, and I don't know who laid the groundwork, and I don't know where that momentum is, or maybe it was the collective of all these people who have been doing programs, and all of a sudden it just, it, it's emerging. I've seen that happen before. And you, you have to move with it, because this is, doesn't happen everywhere. So I'm saying to you, Boston College, you gotta pay attention for some reason there's something sprouting here anew. And, um, you know, I think there's some programs here that should be shared with each other because they're, they're strong and they're great and they'll make a difference, you know?